Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the Greek interpreter interpreted, the Norwood builder built, and the reggae squires puzzled, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. How many disguises did Sherlock Holmes use? What were the street Arabs? And how did he get information from his underground network? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 338, Up From the Needle. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And this is one of those episodes where we look into a piece of Sherlockian scholarship from days gone by, an exemplary piece of Sherlockian scholarship in this series we call Master's Class. And uh, we covered uh, Trevor Hall in the first three episodes of uh, this Master's Class series here in Season 7. And we are now on to Edgar Smith. This is the second entry in the Edgar Smith series here. And this is uh, an article that Edgar wrote. Edgar, of course, was the editor of the Baker Street Journal from 1946 to 1960. Uh, this article he wrote was called Up From the Needle, and it was in volume two, number one of the Baker Street Journal. So that would have been in the spring of 1947. Um, and this, well, what, what, what's, the, what's the thumbnail sketch of this so we can give people a teaser before we go to break? <laughs> The teaser. Well, the teaser is, would you like another glass of wine, my dear? Mm, the, the, I like the that. The teaser is that when we uh, talk about this particular continuing series, what we're interested in uh, sharing with our listeners is some of the great scholarship with an idea of what could you take away from it so that you, too, can play the game. And many of the cases, many of the essays that we review are Essays where the author digs into a particular series of events, a character, a set of circumstances, perhaps offers alternative solutions. But this is not one of those essays. This is an essay where the author, again, puts his style, his word usage, his literary talent to work. And so much of writing great essays, you know, many editors will tell writers, you know, you re if you're very fond of a phrase, um, cut it, don't use it, you know, because it's getting in the way of your storytelling. Well, it's 1947. It's Edgar Smith. He's not cutting anything. He's, he's finding a phrase, enjoying it, rolling the words around in his mouth, putting it on the page. But more to the point, what he is bringing to the table is his erudition, because he's about to talk to us about a subject that he knows something about that he's very interested in, and that subject is wine. Well, uh, let's pause for a moment and give everyone a chance to go fill a glass of their own with uh, whatever your beverage of choice happens to be. And uh, while you're doing that, we'll remind you that the show notes for this episode can be found at iHost.co slash trifles338. That'll take you to the SherlockHolmesPodcast.com website. Um, by the way, if you're not signed up yet for emails from us on that website, it's just another way 
of ensuring that we can get in touch with you and uh, not only let you know that there are new episodes available, but if we happen to come up with any other reasons for contacting you related to uh, the show, we can do it there. And that is also where you can find a very handy link to support us on Patreon. Or you can simply go to patreon.com slash trifles. But either way, uh, your support for the show for as little as $1 a month allows us to do our research and to host the files and to keep the website going and to uh, do all of the things necessary uh, that uh, make a podcast come to life. So we do appreciate your support and your interest in what we do here, and we hope to keep bringing you these episodes for as long as we can. And the conversation keeps going for our Patreon supporters. Just go to patreon.com slash trifles to get some additional bonus material from this episode. Well, as you say, Bert, uh, this is an article where Edgar brings something that he was interested in to the rest of us. And I think that's really one of the hallmarks of the Sherlockian world is we find, well, we all have the, the stories in common. We all understand the character of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. We uh, have appreciated the plots. We come across various points of minutia as we have been now for seven seasons on this show. Uh, but we we find our own personal interests as well. And those color who we are as people and color our experiences and allow us to bring different perspectives to our interpretation. And Edgar, as you say, was interested in, uh, in, in wine. And let's not forget that during this time, uh, this is the 1940s when Edgar was writing, we are coming off of Sherlock Holmes' mania as brought to you by Basil Rathbone and Nigel <laughs> Bruce. And at the very end of the, I think it was the first film they did t together, The Hound of the Baskervilles, um, ba uh, Rathbone's Holmes says to Watson, Quick Watson, the needle. <laughs> and this uh, brought undue attention to Sherlock Holmes as a... Um, as, as a drug addict, as some would have had you believe. And Edgar opens his piece saying that the reputation attributed to Sherlock Holmes for addiction to cocaine and morphine has served, unfortunately, to obscure the name he more justly deserves for a sound and civilized attitude toward the narcotics in their more venial form. Sound and civilized. <laughs> Which I, I like. Uh, I, I, I love... Edgar's ability to turn a phrase here. Um, he mentions, and I had, I had, uh, I had called this out in our pre-show discussion. This noble implement of aqueous dilution, gone in a modern age with the oil lamp and the four-wheeler, stands symbolic of a simpler and more wholesome field of indulgence in which <laughs> Sherlock Holmes acquitted himself intelligently and well. Well, now there he's talking about the gasogene, though. You know, Edgar says Edgar says uh, by That's you right. know by the time is he was at the zenith of his powers, and queen and potentate and pontiff were inclining <laughs> themselves before him in suppliance for his aid. The master had learned without remorse and without regret to reach for the gasogene instead of the needle. Yes, and that's yes, the noble implement of aqueous dilution. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and and uh, he he tells us that uh, Holmes was uh, comprehensive in his appreciation for alcohol. He loved the grape as well as the barley, and he loved both of them. And they're naturally fermented states as well in as in their more potent distillate forms. Mm. Uh, and uh, just as a reminder, we did uh, a couple of episodes uh, related to alcohol. We have a playlist. Uh, together, but just so you know, uh, we did episode uh, 63 uh, inside Baker Street, in inside 221B, called Drink Up, where we looked at the gasogene and the tantalus. And then we did uh, episode 86, where we looked at wine and spirits. We'll have a link to both of those in the show notes. Mm. 
Well, and uh, Edgar, Edgar, you know, then takes us through some of the intersections between Holmes and drink in various forms. He points out that he, Holmes had the good sense to wash down a plate of cold roast beef with a, with a draft of foaming plebeian beer, of course, and that's in Scandal and Bohemia, and then oysters and abrasive grouse. Then we know he insisted on something a little choice in the way of white wines, and that was in Sign of Four. So Edgar steps through these different in, inter the places where spirits and, and alcohol and beverages like that are visible. But then he, he, gets, he gets to the point, he says, it's Holmes's taste in wine, after all, that excites our greatest interest and commands our greatest respect. Whiskey is whiskey, and beer is beer, and even the most ignorant may stumble upon the choicest and best and consume it appropriately in time and place. In the realm of the natural grape, however, a sense of discrimination is essential to even a modest reputation for savoir-boire. And this quality the master possessed to a unique degree, now savoir-boire, savoir-boire is French basically for knowledge of drink. And, and then it, Edgar goes on and says, at base, his preference was Francophile. Of course, he referred to a glass of port. And then there was the Imperial Tokay from Franz Josef's special cellar for von Bork. But it was to the Bordeaux and the Burgundies that Holmes's natural tastes were inclined. Surprisingly, now Edgar's really, <laughs> Edgar's on, on his skates now. He says, surprisingly, for an Englishman of his generation, he seems to have shucked shunned the hawks. Uh, now, hawk, of course, is a series of ge a generic term for German white wine, completely. And nowhere, says Edgar, are the vintages of the Moselle and the Rhineland given mention in the cases. And, and uh, you know, maybe Holmes boycotted uh, German wines even before the Great War. Hmm. Well, there's no reference to him enjoying uh, a little plonk from uh, Chateau de Thames Embankment. <laughs> no, with Rumpole, no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, this this brings to mind a question, um, and, and that is for the average Englishman of the late Victorian era, like Sherlock Holmes was, um, would French wine have been the natural choice? Uh, that is, uh, were there any wines being uh, manufactured in England? Were there any uh, uh, native wines to England that an Englishman would have found passable? Or was French wine simply de rigueur? Oh, well, that's a very good question. I imagine that, that there must have been. I mean, the whole the history of winemaking goes back. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, if you've got grapes uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to make wine and those sorts of customs get passed down, but whether or not there was an established English vineyard anywhere, um, I don't know. I've never heard of it, but that doesn't mean it didn't exist. Hmm. Good question. Well, uh, Edgar continues here. Well, actually, before Edgar continues, let us discontinue, and uh, we'll pick it up after the break. Stay tuned. When you're looking for reference material regarding the Sherlock Holmes stories, the Baker Street Journal has been providing thoughtful articles since 1946. The topics range from the trifling to deep conundrums, but they all center around Sherlockian scholarship. And maybe you've been subscribing for years, or maybe you have yet to subscribe. But there's one resource that can make your research easier to do. The EBSJ. The EBSJ is an electronic copy of all the back issues of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 through 2011 in PDF format. That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages, spanning the old series to the new series, the Christmas annuals, all the way through 2011. It's entirely searchable, so you can find what you need in just seconds. Check out the EBSJ on BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. 
Okay, before I was so rudely interrupted there, I was saying Edward, <laughs> Ed, Edgar by was yourself, continu- you were yes. rudely interrupted how, by yourself. How dare me? Um, yeah. He says, we can be sure in any event that the group of ancient and cobwebby bottles sent by the confectioners to help regale Mr. and Mrs. Francis Hay Moulton and the adventure of the noble bachelor had seen their origin in some first-rate chateau in the Gironde and that Holmes searched the labels beneath the accumulated dust to verify the fact that their local mise en botel, uh, uh, excuse me, of the fact of their local mise en botel. Uh, so too with Bone, uh, which helped to incline Watson sentimentally toward Mary Morstan. Mm-hmm. We can assume if Holmes shared the doctor's repast, as he presumably did, that he made sure of his hospice and his bottling before he partook. <laughs> of course, was in the sign of four. Yeah. So we're getting to the end now of Edgar's review of wines, and he's taken us through the cases and some other alcohol and Holmes's character. And, and uh, you know, now he takes us to something else in one of the cases. He says, a happy commentary on Holmes's wisdom in the art of drinking. Now, again, you have to remember, as you pointed out, 1947, Prohibition ended in the United States. Restrictions on alcohol ended in um, 1933. And so, um, you know, this is in the, in the, being written in the post-Prohibition era. So, uh, you know, but Edgar, so Edgar can talk pretty confidently now about the art of drinking. It's an obscure passage, he says, in the tale of Eugenia Ronder's tragic experience. Before setting out for South Brixton, where the horribly mutilated beauty pondered self-destruction, Holmes discourses sagely to his companion on the futility of speculation when facts are lacking. And then he changes the subject and says, there's a cold partridge on the sideboard, Watson, and a bottle of Montrochet. Let us renew our energies before we make a fresh call upon them. (laughs) Yeah, and then, you know, Edgar says, Montrochet. Ah, it's a compliment to a noble vintage that Sherlock Holmes would have chosen it for restoration when his mind was troubled and distressed, and that that he would have come, even so late in life, to prefer it to hypodermic and gasogene alike. But it's a tribute to his taste and discernment that he should have fixed upon what Corte Pe has called. Corte Pe, Cloud uh, Corte Pe was a... um, he was a historian of um, Burgundy in in the uh, 1600s, I think, who was also a priest, I think. He'd written about Burgundy. What, what Cortet P.A. had called, with delightful understatement, the most excellent white wine of Europe, la, le plus excellent vin blanc d'Europe, d'Europe. The presence of Montrachet on the Baker Street sideboard was, we have to assume, a matter of studied and deliberate choice, and it stamps Sherlock Holmes in the matter of his ultimate preference in the narcotics, with the hallmark of savant and connoisseur. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that is delightful. And and, and right there in that concluding paragraph, we get the sense that um, not only does Edgar know his wines, but he also knows his his, his wine history, uh, to know someone like uh, Cortepe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very, I would think. Not too many people in 1940s. Well, who knows? But it no. wouldn't seem to me that people were well, reading about Well, uh, look, it's, it's highly likely that, uh, as you say, this is, this is Basil Rathbone's era. Um, and and uh, I think 45 <laughs> or 46, he and uh, Nigel Bruce were just coming off of their radio program. Um, they were pushing people in an entirely other direction with domestic wine, with our friends from Petri. And uh, it was not likely that the average radio listener, the average Sherlock Holmes fan, should we say, uh, was familiar with anything but Petri wine when it came to Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Petri wine, a nice glass of Petri wine is the perfect thing to have for your dessert trifle. (laughs) And that is just a trifle. (laughs) It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. 
please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri. Petri.